Good, so, so thank you. My name is uh, Gadi Oren, and uh, as Ariel mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm founder and the, the technical um, side of, uh, of the team of uh, CloudScope. And uh, I'm going to be talking tonight about a little uh, piece of infrastructure we've developed slowly over um, the course, of, I think, of nine months. Um, uh, usually this is a, uh, I think, an undertaking that's very, very hard to do, and uh, it just happened because we, every time we needed something, we just added a little piece, and after nine months, there was enough of, the, of it there that we thought, uh, hey, why don't we just uh, put it out there, and now it's, uh, it's open source, and uh, uh, one, of, uh, one of my goals here is to see if there's, if there's some interest, and uh, hopefully some people would like to uh, contribute to that. Okay, so, um, who are we? So, I mentioned the, the name of the company, CloudScope, um, and uh, we're doing a product that enables IT vendors to automate the pre-sales by collecting information from the target, um, from the target environment, especially around performance, bring that back and crunch it and create uh, specific reports that helps them with the sales process. Um, in a previous cycle, we worked on a different product that's called uh, Lucidel, that was the main cause for creating the infrastructure we, I'm, I'm talking about right now. Uh, that was really about uh, uh, business to consumer marketing analytics uh, based on uh, website data. So uh, some of the examples I'm going to show will actually look like uh, processing of web data. That's not by accident. It's just because I, I took that data and kind of um, cleansed, it, cleansed it a little and, and used it for unit testing and, and examples. Um, other than that, we're doing just uh, all sorts of data intensive projects um, and websites. Uh, we, we like Django, so we prefer working in that environment, but it's not, we're doing other things as well. And uh, one of the things we focus a lot is, is projects that have a large amount of data and, and analytics, and that's something we do for other companies as a way of funding ourselves. So if anybody's, uh, you know, interested in that, uh, capabilities, you know, would love to, to talk. Um, okay, so, why, uh, why this uh, infrastructure? Why have we done that? Um, there are certain problems that, um, that can, um, that lend themselves very well to NoSQL database. And I think the, the interest in the, in the group is, is coming from um, for that point. Um, and then the, the process is that somebody says, hey, you know, NoSQL could be really good here, why don't we experiment with that? Uh, but usually there's a problem, there are a number of problems, because a lot of code needs to be rewritten just to experiment with, with basic things with NoSQL, because it's so different. Um, the team needs to learn a new API, or at least one or two people to start with, uh, and a lot of processes and tools that, that were already in place all of a sudden stops working. So whether it's unit testing uh, all the way through uh, different little tools that you develop to run certain things, uh, going through the admin API, that's a, a really nice tool. Um, things just stop working and you have to redo them. Um, so some of the data, uh, on, on top of that, and that's really not a problem, it's just a part of the domain, some of the data needs to be slightly denormalized. If, if everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say denormalized, right? Um, just because the, the state of mind of um, NoSQL is different. It's coming from a point of view of saying, if there is almost no problem with space, and at the same time you can't do a join, how would you organize your data differently? It leads to slight denormalization of the data, eventually. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about that. That's just part of, of the domain, and this is not part of this uh, lecture. But it does lead to some of the decisions that were made um, in the infrastructure. So uh, our example specifically, which maps to the same lines I, I mentioned in the previous slide, was 
that we uh, were processing very, very large set of time series, primarily information that came from website and other sources, and we need to do that very efficiently, very quickly, uh, and we needed to also uh, ef efficiently get, slice and dice the data, get to a set of, of time series, and then perform some activity on it, whether it's correlation or, or averaging or summing or some, some operation. Um, the data, unfortunately, was, was, was very, is, was changing from record to record. So not all time series were the same resolution, the same size. Not for every time series. We didn't have all the data for every time series. For example, we, we had demographics information, so we never knew everything about everyone, just bits and pieces. So that in, impacted how the data looks like. And obviously, it, it gets harder and harder to try and do all that stuff in, in relational. And um, the, the, the main problem was, you know, the way we work, we, we have a small, very distributed team. You know, some are, are sitting here, some in Ukraine, some in South America. You know, to develop a complete new skill and uh, change, kind of change the engine while, fl while it flight was, was really very painful. So um, instead, we just tried a couple of things. Uh, we started with putting a stub of a manager, and that gave us some capabilities. And then every time we ran into a problem where it wasn't good enough, we just added a little more. <laughs> That's what we ended with, um, with a pretty large uh, kind of a piece of infrastructure. Um, OK, so uh, I'm going to just quickly touch on other packages. Uh, because this is there are other things out there that do stuff with MongoDB. So PyMongo, I think everybody that did Python with MongoDB knows PyMongo. It's excellent. It's actually um, a dependency for what we did here. Under under the hood, we're using PyMongo. Um, there's Mongo Engine that has actually somewhat similar concepts, at least around abstracting documents as as a model class. Uh, however, it's not really tightly embedded into, into uh, Django. Um, and uh, there's also a set of versions of MongoDB that are non-relational MongoDB versions. I, I don't know enough about those, but when I looked at them, they just looked very, very scary to use because they, required, they basically required you to change the entire version of Django, which is uh, not something we wanted to experiment on a live order. Um, okay. <coughs> so, um, so yes. Somebody is that a fork of Django to basically be non-relational? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's a fork. That's a non-relational fork. Yeah, and I don't. I don't think there will ever. There was an expectation that they will be able to complete the work and push it back. I don't think that ever happened. I, I'm. I'm I even think that they may have abandoned it, yeah. but I'm not sure. Because when you work with Django for a while, you see that the relational aspects are so, uh, you know, almost hard-coded into it, it's, it's very, very difficult to completely change it to a, to a non-relational. I, I don't know wh what they were even, how they were going about it, but probably interesting. But. Um, so very quickly, Advantages we saw from, from going kind of Django native is you can use packages. You know, there's so many things you can add on to, to Django, and it, but for all, in order for them to work, you need to be using something that Django is familiar with, um, which which this package achieves partially, not all the way. Um, similar code conventions, easier to bring new team members, and unit testing and and other frameworks. Though some but. Someone mentioned unit testing. I, I personally believe that you know, it's extremely important. And uh, if you're bringing something new that doesn't support unit testing, then you know, too bad. Um, experimentation. So, uh, any any questions so far? Wait. So, are are you implementing Mongo behind the scenes with? maintaining a somewhat relational <coughs> model then? Not somewhat, completely. Uh, what we're doing is is basically using the same Mongo. Mm -hmm. So how, how many in the room, show of hands, actually did a project with Django and a non-relational at the same time? Okay. 
So, okay, so you end up with two databases, right? Every single time. The relational does all the administration work and maybe some other things, and then the data ends up being pulled, placed in the, right? So um, we didn't step away from this model. We just wanted to make it less painful. Okay. So th that would be, I mean, since there was a question, it's a good time to, uh, you know, uh, we put it in open source, and I haven't touched the code for a couple months, so um, when we, we talked about this topic, I was like, okay, I need to get back into the code. So I took, I, I took like a half, half built demo application that, that I was planning always to put there, and actually completed it, and it's, it's up and running and live now. The application allows you to ask questions. So, and, in, and it keeps the data inside MongoDB, and allows you to also upload pictures and stuff. So if you want, you can go to this address right now with your cell phone and register and <coughs> ask questions and uh, vote on other people's questions. So if that's, uh, if that's interesting, um, <coughs> you can add this on the side. Um, it was uh, optimized for mobile, so it's going to look less exciting on a laptop, but also, might also work. So, um, yeah, that's how it looks on a, on a browser that was uh, that was uh, reduced to the size of the cell phone. Um, okay, any other questions? Good. So um, let's uh, let's get started. Um, I'm starting with migrating an existing model. So, uh, and somebody asked a question even before the, the lecture about that. Uh, what, what do I mean by migrating? Migrating, I meant, um, let's assume I want to experiment. Let's assume I have this model and it works right, on relation, right now on the relational database. What does it take for me to move it to run inside MongoDB? Um, so we have here a very small uh, two models. Uh, basically, there's a book, and uh, you know the name and the author are defining uniqueness, and then there's an author with a first name and a last name. Simple stuff, right? Uh, if you want to move that to MongoDB, uh, basically look at the bold stuff. I just replaced the model dot models dot model with Mongo model in the two. Uh, different uh, classes and added this uh, little uh, magic at the end of all the models and that's it right so obviously I'm, 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 I'm cheating a little right because these are really really simple models if I take something very complex it's not going to be as fun but but that's the intention the intention is to make it really simple um, the last thing at the bottom is really about helping you be able to use the standard sync DB and things like that that Mongo provide um, and, uh, and make everything work. So um, once I've done that, uh, the next step is to do a sync DB. So if you look at the result of the sync DB, you'll see what you usually see, creating tables and all that stuff. But there's also a couple of things that wasn't there before, like uh, creating, installing indexes for textbook model, TST book model, and some other um, verbiage about other indexes that are that don't need don't need to be installed because they already they already exist. That stuff comes from the new support for SyncDB. What it actually does is it goes to MongoDB and makes sure that the, does all the housekeeping in terms of models and definitions of indexes, etc. Um, and now look, let's let's look at how we're adding a, an object. Um, so I'm going into uh, the console, import date time, import the actual model, deleting everything before because I, I did that many times and there was a lot of a lot of garbage in the database. Uh, I'm defining an author here, which is myself, and a test book, which is Goodnight Half Moon. By the way, I have a 
a daughter, she's one year old, and I, I'm, I'm pretty close to have written this book by now, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say. And uh, uh, so published it, and right here I'm actually doing a get on the author I just added. See, everything kind of works very nicely. And then I, I, I list all the test book, all the books I have in the model, and I can see there's one book, Good Night Half Moon, written by uh, Gadi Owen. Good. So that looks kind of easy, looks working. Um, next thing that I'm trying to do is I'm going to try and breach the uniqueness. As you remember, there was a definition of unique together for the author and the book name. So, um, oh, I actually made it easier to work. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm basically executing the same large um, statement again, which should create a breach because um, I'm trying to put in another object with the same indexes. And uh, what you get as a result is this ugly arrow. Um, you can see the, the command at the top. Ugly arrow going to the bottom. Duplicate key arrow um, and all the details. So right now I'm getting support for the unique to together that's part of Django. Only the implementation of the unique together is obviously provided to us by the MongoDB. Okay, so part of, uh, of, of what we do. Uh, any any question on this little example so far? Yes. So I'm I'm used to Great question. So um, I actually have a slide on that, and the answer is yes. You have Django. The, the way Django um, helps you define tables in the database is by defining a class that's a model, and on each one of the fields you can say something. You can say what's its size, what's its type, and and you can say if it's a a, a DB index or not. Now. That's, that's nice for individual fields, but sometimes you also want to define the unique, uniqueness together of multiple fields. Okay? Django provides you that support. And when the model is... In, in my C project, I can tell it, well, you know, these two fields form a unique index. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes, and that's exactly the point. You define it in Mongo, and Mongo translates it that's the, the ORM layer translates all the, the, what you want to the different dialects of SQL. So for MySQL, it's what, what MySQL is doing for Postgres, for SQLite, and now, same thing works for MongoDB. Uh, same concept, starting from almost the same text, okay? And there's actually, next slide, I think, shows something about that. Um, so, exactly, exactly to your question, um, the same data I showed you through the console of, um, of Django, Python console, I'm showing you now in the console of MongoDB. So we're going into MongoDB, and um, I have a, a database called MoMA Example, and I'm looking at the different collections. I can see just a number of them. Uh, the important ones that I just um, worked with was testing underscore TST author and testing underscore TST book. Now if you worked with, uh, if you looked at how um, uh, a SQL database, let's say MySQL, how the tables look like, they look exactly like that. There's gonna be the name of the package, which I call testing underscore the name of the table. Only that in Mongo, it's collections. I dump the content of the entire two collections don't usually do that, because usually there's millions of objects. Uh, and you can see the data uh, organized in JSON, which is the internals of MongoDB. Um, and uh, so this, this should answer exactly your question. Uh, I've also asked to look at the indexes of that specific table. And I see three groups, the ID, and by the way, this is almost exactly the same in, in a relational database. The ID is always an index, the ID of the object. And any foreign key is always an, uh, always an ID. So here it's the author, is the foreign key. And then the unique together that came directly from the model 
is represented right there in the middle with a kind of a double index. Okay? All that work was done doing the sync DB, basically. So, um, so here's a nice bonus. Uh, there's enough in there, in this manager, to allow the admin to work. Okay, so that's not trivial. The, the admin requires a lot of interfaces to work in order for it to actually work. Right now what you're seeing is an object that lives in, in MongoDB presented in the admin console that usually do not do that. Now not everything, we didn't get to kind of everything to work within the admin. Uh, I'll talk about in, you know, other slides, yes. So the IDs, <coughs> just like normal Django, are they just iterating by one? What, what do you mean? Well, I mean, that they're not universally unique IDs. They're just, you know, sort of IDs. No, no, no. Uh, good question, actually. No. Um, what we're actually using is the internal standard Mongo approach to life, which is more of a U UUID. They're not iterating. They're unique. They're completely unique. So let's just say that I'd want to have um, the same app in three different data centers and three comments. Yeah. And that, you know, there's a, there's a server for the app and a DB server. Yeah. And I wanted to do replication, you know, streaming from the different Mongo boxes back mm -hmm. and forth. Um, would that work or am I going to run into an issue when I have keys? Because it looks like the keys are going to be iterating by one regardless of how they're being stored in the database. Um, so the keys will not be. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering why why you think there would be iterating the, by one. One on the sort order. The one just means this. This is the sort order. This ah. is not the, the iteration for form. Okay. So it's going to be one if it's uh, if it's ascending and minus one if it's descending, or stuff like that. It has nothing to do with the ID. I can see where where the confusion comes okay. from. Okay. Uh, Look at the object ID. In there. Yeah. You see, this is the object ID. It's, it's very very close to UUID. Maybe it's a UUID of some form. Uh, and with regards to application, as long as you move things around and there is no identical key in the other compartment, shouldn't be a problem. So those also differ by one. I'm sorry? Those also look like they differ by one. Yeah, but that's weird. okay. You know, that's uh, usually the way, again, I, I'm not sure if it's a UUID, but if it is, then it's unique to that instance, to that box. The fact that it, it, it progresses by one um, doesn't matter. Uh, the probability of the same key exists in another MongoDB somewhere else is very, very low. And so, again, not, not, not something that I'm an expert in, or in, but as far as I know. So given that it sounds like we do end up with UUIDs, which would be useful for the use case I was talking about, um, does that create issues working with other packages? which you're expecting? Um, mm, uh, it's going to have to be a case by case. Uh, you know, everything I'm going to show here is obviously because I'm doing the presentation. It's going to look somewhat easy, but it's not always easy, OK? <laughs> Let's be honest. There's, there's a lot of gotchas that happen. And um, you know, as the doctor says, some, some discomfort will be experienced. <laughs> That's when you, you know you're, you are in big trouble. <laughs> yes? Yeah, just to, to throw in on the ID thing here. Mongo lets you create your own ID style if you want. If you don't create an ID, it'll make the object ID for you. And so it's going to be a UUID. If you have some uh, technological need for having a different ID, you just always add another field to make that the ID here. So you, can, you don't have to create the default object ID. I think I, I, think I might, may have used to know that at some point. Then. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry? I've also seen MP5s. Okay. Yeah. I mean, MongoDB is very rich. It actually brings a very interesting point. If people like this and want that to do more, there's still not a lot of code. You're welcome to step in and, uh, you know, do whatever you want, basically. So, um, okay. So, um, <coughs> we also added a few new field types, okay? That's where we're going a little bit beyond the standard Django because, I mean, actually there's no point to do 
to, to completely take MongoDB and, and push the, the square peg into a round hole. That's, I mean, because it needs, the database is there to do other things, right? So if we completely make it look like a, a relational database, then it's going to be a relational database. That's no point. It needs to be able to do other things. And uh, um, that, that kind of can be done by using those uh, additional fields. So the date and time field is just a time zone aware field. Uh, Mongo gets really, really angry if you don't include time zone and you know, curse and, and say bad things. And so that helps with that. Values field is basically a list of objects. Can be any objects. So I, I'm, I'm assuming that, that there's good familiarity with MongoDB in the, oh, am I wrong? Yes, no? Yeah, no, no okay. So, so a couple of words. MongoDB is really interesting because it, it stores documents. If, if, you, if you take like a, a deeply, deeply nested structure and, and dump it in JSON, that's pretty much how MongoDB stores it. So that's, that's cool, that's nice. I mean, we can do that without MongoDB. The interesting thing, some, one interesting thing, one interesting aspect is that you can actually do a deep query. You can query objects based on keys that are nested in very, very deep. So, and, and, and it's okay if they don't exist. So you can actually work on, on documents that are completely different from each other and still be able to do queries in a meaningful way and change things in a meaningful way. So you can go with any, any depth that you want and, and dump very big objects there. Um, those embedded documents? I'm sorry? Those embedded documents? Embedded documents? What do you mean? So Mongo has a document, but you can also embed documents in that document? Yeah, of course. I mean, document is, a, document is not, it's not look like your typical Word doc or something like that. It's just a, a uh, term that, that NoSQL uses because they, they can't use tables, so they use a document. Document usually means a heap of things that could be nested it could have a blob in there, if you want, or a number of them. It could, could have text. So anything, really anything you want. It also implies, um, you know, where, where, where's the boundary of, uh, th there's no transactions per se, like in relational, but <coughs> usually most of the non-SQL would give you atomic separation when you're working on a single document at, at different levels. Depending on, you know, if it's Cassandra, it might be different than if it's Mongo. It, it, um, but I think to your answer, it could be a, you, could have, you could have embedded documents, yes. Um, actually, the, the application that, that I kind of um, gave you the link earlier is exactly that, showing that demo of, you know, you can add a question and then you can take a picture right from your cell phone and upload it into the question, right? And it's, it's all kept in there. So um, values field is basically a list of objects. Could be any object. Uh, strings list field is the same, but just for strings. And dictionary field is what you know as a dictionary form, uh, Python. Uh, and again, the key can be, usually there are strings, but uh, they can be other things. And then the, the payload could be anything. Uh, with one exception, that to get everything to work like what I show here, I actually, we were actually unable right now to give you any depth, only like drill into level two or something like that. Um, that's not something that can't be done, we just didn't spend enough time doing it. Uh, and when I, I mean doing it, it means when you look at the admin interface, you may not be able to, you may be able to view the data, but not be able to edit it because there's no, or forms that are able to deal with that, the depth of data. So all sorts of things might start breaking, but nobody prevents you from doing that. And nobody prevents from you to take the object and go low level to PyMongo and do whatever you want there. This thing will keep on working. It's just gonna disregard what you did you know, outside the model, but it's still gonna work, okay? Questions? I guess I just have one. Yeah. You started, it seems like you said when you started your discussion, it was, uh, you went down this route because of time series? Yes. 
Are you going to go back? To my, I'm just hooked onto that one because I went, I went the Cassandra route, and I was, ah. I was trying to figure out why, you know, how Mongo would have worked. So are you, are we going back? That's very that? good. Uh, actually, let's talk after because the the second project we did, which again, because we were doing a lot of analytics, so time series is kind of like staple, and we spent a lot of time making time series work excellent in MongoDB, and then we learned that Cassandra can do it, same level of ease, maybe easier. Okay. Just, it is what it is. So uh, I can actually, if you'd like, I can tell you everything about the experience of comparing what we did in each one. Uh, I can tell you just one small thing is the query capabilities of MongoDB are by far superior to what Cassandra has. And that by itself creates an interesting opportunity. You know, there are other things I don't like about, about MongoDB, like memory management and don't get me started, but uh, scale, scale out. Uh, so it's 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 always like you have to choose your, your poison, right, for the project. Uh, no, I'm not going to go back to specifically to time series, but I can tell you that some of those fields were developed around it, like values field is specifically to hold time series, okay, and uh, any any length. Right? We have uh, on that Lucidel system, we have uh, I think in one of the collections there's about four million objects. And some of them go back a year to a year and a half worth of very detailed time series. And it all sings very nicely, runs very cool. Okay. That's a Mongo thing. It's not this, you know, this, this, this infrastructure is a bridge between what you can express in Django and the capabilities of MongoDB. So what I said is, is, is about MongoDB, DB's capability, not about this, right? because MongoDB can, can carry that. Um, OK. So just to comment. Uh, yes. <clears throat> there's a database called TempoDB, okay. which is specially designed for storing time series data. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of those. Optimized. Yeah. 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 There's, also, there's also recently I ran into a combination of PyTable and um, some other packages that can allow you to do pretty extraordinary things with time series, like financial time series, it's just unbelievably fast. I was, I was very surprised. But it's, but it's also very specific to Python. Uh, Pi tables and uh, there's additional packages that are done on top of it. Um, they, I'm sorry, I'm digressing, but they've optimized for the fact that there's almost one architecture right now, which is Intel. And they, they actually optimize the way you extract data to make sure that the branch prediction on the level of the CPU will always work for you. So, you know, very, very extreme stuff. So, um, OK. So um, I apologize for people that are new to Django. There's going to be a few of those slides that are going to be kind of based on assumptions that you, you work with, with Django a lot. Um, so um, the first thing I'm going to show is bulk insert. Um, so when you um, when you work with this framework, when we worked with it at, at the beginning, and it all worked fine and was working very nice, but it, in some situations it was excruciatingly slow. And we, we realized that insert, when you insert a massive amount of data into MongoDB, if you do it one by one, it's just a Mongo thing, it's not fast. But it, MongoDB provides you the ability to do bulk insert. So we kind of translated it all the way up. So if you do a lot of those objects, um, and you do uh, bulk insert, it, it just works very fast. Okay. Um, so this is uh, exactly one of those examples that I mentioned before, which is about website data. So you'll see all sorts of things like location, and, and what was the exit path, and you know lending landing page, the film, all sorts of things like that. Uh, the unit tests are full yeah. of that stuff, but none of it is actually real data. I reviewed it one by one to make sure there's no identifying information. Um, OK. So, so here are a few other examples. Now, this, these examples are, are focusing on showing how the translation from the language um, of 
Mongo, uh, of, uh, of uh, Django to the dialect of Mongo, of, uh, actually of Pi, uh, Pi, uh, uh, Pi Mongo. Okay. So some, some of you are familiar with Pi Mongo? Work with it before? Okay, so you know, you know what you see. Uh, the Zephyr guys. Are... Okay. Um, just uh, uh, and, and for people who are, are new to, to Django, um, this is the way Django expresses a uh, a query. So you'd have the name of a variable, and then underscore underscore uh, represents either a relationship or a join. So right here, this is about first visit date is less than or equal this date, okay? Um, that is uh, translated behind the scenes, so this is part of the unit test, right? I'd give it an expression that's uh, supposed to work in Django, and I wanna see what would PyMongo do, okay? So uh, that's translated to first visit date and uh, less than or equal this data, okay? And, um, Here's another one that's a little bit more complex. You can see that we want the first visit date to be smaller than this, the time on site to be greater than 10, and the page views greater than two. And again, this is translated to a much larger uh, PyMongo expression, but still a correct one and valid one that will uh, produce the, the right result. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, I have a few of those. If I see people falling asleep, I'll skip. Um, okay. So here's uh, here's one that I can at least get excited about. Um, so uh, uh, Q Q expressions are supported. Are you familiar with Q expressions? So um, they they give you the ability to express a lot more complex type of queries and. Uh, um, when you get to them, you, you, you really need them. You can't do, do anything without that. So in this example, there is time on site is 10, time on site is also 25, okay? It doesn't have to be logical. And time on site is also 275. Uh, obviously, that, that's gonna be an empty query, but let's see if the query is translated correctly. And that's a place where we were actually able to catch the fact that all the parameters are the same one and instead of creating a very complex argument, yes. Doesn't the pipe mean or in the query? Pipe means or. Oh, Sorry, you're right. Sorry. It's okay. Thank you. It actually does make sense. Um, so um, basically, because uh, they are all using the same um, the same parameter, you can condense it into a very very efficient time over query, uh, which is basically time on site is one of those. Okay, um, very cool, works faster, efficient, yes. So does the OR like, respect the, the debug settings so that if you turn debug on for your site, you can see the resulting queries? Like, Django will show you SQL statements. SQL statements. One, of the, one of the features I hate the most. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The SQL, right? well, yeah, because I, you know, as much as I remember this function, I always get in every new project to a situation where I say, why am I having a memory leak? <laughs> What's going on with the memory leak? And it takes me like an hour to remember that if you don't turn this off, you have like every single query that you ever generated kept in somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, maybe because I'm, I'm, I don't like it, it's not supported. But uh, <laughs> you know, but you can actually get to. You see, it's it's not very far. Basically, if you get the query set here. If you look at the query set dot query dot spec, you can actually see what came out. This is right there. That's not the interesting. Right? So that's it. It's it's just a second before it's being sent to PyMongo for execution. And uh, to your question, I think the only user of the, the application. Uh, actually, I don't know if it's the only user. Allow me to. Wireless external. Guest external. 
<clears throat> Wireless external. Okay. I need to listen. I just don't <laughs> see. I, okay, wireless external. Yeah. I'm not going into this. Okay, so uh, this is the example of it's a Django application. And uh, oh, yeah, we have. Uh, do you have the third execution? From John, Jonathan, and surprise, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. Now, uh, that gets me a little excited just because what you've seen here is an image that went through the Django all the way into MongoDB and back out. Okay, there was no, no relational database behind the, the you know, behind the curtain, uh, maybe just a little. But, uh, but it's actually, it's running on MongoDB and uh, SQLite. And you know that SQLite, if I would try to shove these type of objects into SQLite, we would just not have any results here. Uh, so the third execution, to your question, Jonathan, yes. Um, it, it works uh, very similar to the concepts of uh, Django, which I'm sure is similar to the concept of uh, Flask. As you define the query, it just accumulates not as objects, but as a definition of a query, right? So, um, and it's lazy execution. When you start asking for results, that's where it comes up. Now, that feature is, uh, uh, this infrastructure has very little to do with it because this is how most of the underlying databases would like to help you work with, like PyMongo, it does that for you, right? So, and we're using PyMongo, so. Um, so this is mine, my demo question. My son is very gifted. Uh, hold on, is that a fish that's also mine? Do you love MongoDB? Well, yeah. What's your test coverage? Interesting. Um, who asked that? Oh, picture. It's good. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> HTML5 works. Very soon, maybe we won't need uh, apps. Maybe. So, good stuff. Uh, I think that's a nice example. I like it. I wrote it and I like it. Um, so, multiple queue expressions. I think we've, we've covered that. Uh, this is very similar to the previous one, only that here we were not able to do an optimization because right there there's a question, um, there's an expression that works on a different parameter and a different type of uh, data. So uh, this is producing the very long and cumbersome expression. Yes? Yeah, given that that looks like it's the same query except you added the source equals bang. Why couldn't you use the same logic to use the in function and then just add all our app? We could. I was just... Uh, you just did it. Exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, when you do things that are open source, you're just like, yeah. hey, you know, I got a day job and... I would pay for it, but nobody yeah. else does now. So, uh, here we go. So, um, here's a negative uh, of, a, of a Q method. Uh, at that point, it starts to spill into all those, uh, I'm sure a lot of you heard it in, in, you know, in computer science 101 courses, the Morgan, you know, the Morgan rules and all this and the replacing O with an N and this, all this crap. Uh, I mean, it's just, uh, it's in there for optimizations and uh, um, you'll see some of that right now. Um, okay, so now that is actually more interesting. That's another extension beyond um, beyond what Django is doing. So I remember I, I spoke about the fact that you can put like any depth of documents into MongoDB and then you can query on that. That's a key feature. It's, it's very, very useful. It's very important. And so what we did is we kind of piggybacked on the relation, on the relation, uh, sorry, I'd like to use this very sensitive wheel. Um, the relation underscore underscore, and uh, if there is such a key, we actually translate it to location dot 
LG, which is in that case is region, it's a, it's a state. Um, but what it means for MongoDB is step in. So, so if you look at oh my God, what's this? Microsoft. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'll have to start again. <laughs> Everybody remember your this is what it is. It happens. Uh, let me see. No. Ah, okay. So, while we're, while we're here. Uh, so, you see, uh, I was talking about the um, going in, right? Oh. So, this is what it means. You see, I have one of the structures actually have depth. It's a it's a dictionary field, and it has country, region, and, uh, and city. Not always, sometimes. It doesn't have to be there. But you can query on it. The way you do this query in the language of, Pi, Pi, uh, of um, Mongo, DB and, and PyMongo, is by saying location.lg. So now, you can actually express that with, um, with, with Django. And the reality is you can go as deep as you want. You don't have to do one. It's just that you, you wouldn't be able to use this framework to create the depth. But if you create it using PyMongo, you can query on it using, um, using Django. So uh, here's another one. Exists. That's that word. Like you see that one at the end? So you already know about the dot notation. Now it's about operators that doesn't exist today in <laughs> that, that are not available today in in Django, exists is not something you need in Django because the structure is rigid. It's always there. But you do need it in MongoDB because you don't know if it's there. Um, and uh, next slide, I'm going to show an example of that. So another one is type. Because the, the, the content is so flexible, you don't even know what's the type of the data. Is it a string? Is it an integer? So that's another tool that can you can actually query and give you the object where the uh, landing, pa landing page path type is int. Makes no sense at all. It's probably an error, but now I can find that error. Okay. Um, so here's an example to how would use how you would use that. So I'm looking at the unique visit all objects. This is what I have in the unit tests. I have only 20 of them. Um, and then I ask, okay, uh, well, I'll go after that to Nerd Center to have a to tell, share a piece of my mind. My God. It just crashed on me altogether. I have to use the PDF version. <clears throat> okay. Nothing else to make me feel better. I almost bought another Samsung, and then I bought this, but I just couldn't stand it. I, I, so oh, watching that crash, I'm feeling better. No, no, I, I think, I think, I think I'm, I'm joining your, uh, your group. It's like the majority of people. You know that. So you know that uh, officially, Apple now sells more computers than all the other vendors combined. Yeah, I just said I was very smart. So they can't be wrong, everybody. I must be wrong. So let's do this quickly before it crashes. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What to do. uh, so um, exists. Um, so um, okay, my line of thoughts. Uh, now let's check. Where, so uh, as I mentioned, this data that we, we would have from the website, would have, uh, we would bring in additional demographics information. That was some, some magic behind the scenes, and we had demographics on people that went into a website. But we didn't have always demographics. Like for some, we'd have age, for some gender, for some education, etc. So right now I'm asking, how many do I have information about age? Only seven. How many gender? Only three. And how many? 
do I have both age and gender? Well, it's only one. So using those the exist operations, I can actually now query not just about the data, but also about the metadata, about the structure of the data that sits in MongoDB. That's very powerful. Um, OK. So uh, before I, I move on, any, any questions? Another, yes? I didn't really understand what you meant by metadata. metadata. OK, so, um, so think about this way. You have document database is very flexible. You can put small thing or you can put a massive thing. For example, the questions I just shown you, I just showed in the example, um, there are questions that have only text. The size is a dozen of bytes. And then the ones with the images, that could be megabytes. Megabyte, many megabytes, because what he uploads from his phone yeah, is actually a ton of data. I actually had to compress the image before sending it back. It was very, very heavy. <coughs> So all that stuff lives, and they are, this is document, and this is document. They're not created equal. Now, if you want to get to a document based on not just what data is in there, but what's the structure of the data, what's the depth, are there certain keys exist or not, right? You, there is no reasonable way or no easy way to do that with a relational database. You'd have to have many, many different tables to just be able to answer this question. And there are real life ap applications for that. If you're running a store and you're selling shoes and shirts, other than the price tag, they share very little few other attributes. But you want to manage them because they are both items in your store. Mm -hmm. So when you have a MongoDB, that gets really much more comfortable doing that. Uh, but you want to ask something like, oh, give me all the objects that actually have shoelaces. Right, and all of a sudden you get only the shoes department and not, the sh the sh you, you know. Yeah, so, okay. so, you were, so when you think about the real ta real life applications of that, it's huge. There's a huge value in that. That if you were to you were to replicate that in a in a rigid relational database, ton of work. Okay. <coughs> okay. That's really about no SQL, not about. This fun, right? It's just enabling it to get the value. So, um, so the last bit, I guess, oh, we're getting close to the end, but uh, something that's important here is uh, you've seen in the demo application that you can add a text, you can vote on the questions, all that's fine. By the way, the voting. I also did the voting using kind of a value object that holds the IDs of who voted. So, you know, I just wanted to put everything in mobile, of course. Um, but the one thing I didn't talk about is, you know, okay, so if I want to attach a picture, I want to attach a, a video, uh, I, was, I was really tempted. The, the HTML tags, <laughs> HTML5 tags, allow you to take even a, a video from your phone and upload it, or, or an audio, or anything. Uh, so I was like, yeah, let's, let's bring everything, but it's just a lot of work. So, but but you, can, uh, you can do that. Uh, the question is, how do you manipulate those objects? So um, if you were to use PyMongo, maybe you choose a different structure. I chose a very flat structure, just because that's what we can do in this framework. So um, um, this is the model of the demo application that you have seen briefly or you may see on your phone or on your um, laptop. Uh, this is the model. It's a Mongo model. It has a user, which by the way, does not live in Mongo. This is a reference to a user that lives in a relational database, which in that case is SQLite that's managed by Django. So there is references between the two models between two different databases. It's very nice, but I wouldn't push it very far because it fades very quickly. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're trying, like, if you're excited about doing queries across two databases, you know, I, you know, we could make that work, but it would be so bad that you wouldn't want to use it. So it pretty much doesn't work uh, very well. Uh, but but it's there and it's very convenient because you you just use the objects, right? Um, date. So the actual question, couple, you know, 256, 
um, and then a bunch of dictionary fields. Uh, you can say for the dictionary fields, if you want the, pe the, the, the inside payload to be of a certain type, like char or text, or you can just leave it open, which means I'll do other side later. It doesn't have to be rigid. So if you, if you define this model with not the Mongo data field, but just the normal Django data field, would it, would it throw an exception? Or would it no, no, these, most of those are, are normal. Uh, well, actually not, not, but because there's not a lot of them here. But yeah, char, models char field. This one? No, I'm talking about the, the date time field. You, oh, uh, yeah. If you, yeah. If you use the normal one, it's going to be a problem because um, because the date time field does not impose, does not require you to be um, not, aware of time zone. Time zone naive. Time zone naive, and, and that that makes everybody really angry and whatever. But it's very thin. It's it's very small object. Yeah, no, I get that. I'm just trying to figure out what it. Yeah. Do you, are you trying to support that type? By doing translation in the back end and imposing time zone? Or Something like that. You are doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just MongoDB, just, they, they took, the, I think, the right decision, which is you will not be working with naive objects. Just work. That's it. Makes sense, I think. Because the, the whole duality is just too complex. That's super um, yeah, that's like a landmine of, of errors. Uh, okay, so um, uh, this is, yeah, this is typical. Uh, those are new. And uh, again, the uniqueness here, uh, very standard stuff. So uh, the first piece is, and again, I, I'm sorry, people that didn't do a lot of Django would find that really out of the blue. But there is a, a phase where you're getting back a form. The form includes an image. Um, we're taking up the image. It, it also includes, uh, if you look at the, at the form and the demo application, there's a hidden uh, there's a hidden question ID field in there. So we're taking the question ID, basically querying this, querying it out, uh, getting the doc name, and um, huh, I have a, an extra line though. It's not unnecessary. Um, next is storing the metadata of the image. So we're basically keeping the name of the image, keeping the Static um, uh, kind of static URL name and content type, and eventually, right here, uh, we're getting the the actual image right there. Okay, and I've written detailed notes about you should not do this. <laughs> okay, because if this would be a video file that is, uh, you know, 200 megabyte size, I just crashed my server. Because everything goes into the memory and it's a huge mess. But for small images like what we're doing here, that is good enough. And I encode it, I push it back into the image and save. Pretty simple stuff, right? Very, very convenient. Um, here's how it looks in the admin interface. Okay? So, I got my users here, dates, question. Those are not your questions. Those are my test questions from before. Uh, these are the voter IDs. Okay? Those are actually IDs that come from the other database. They are, it's kind of a uh, confusing thing. Uh, the IDs of the users that come from the SQLite. Uh, these are the documents, name of document, and content type. Um, you may notice that I, I did a lot of effort to remove the point, the dot, from the name. That's because of what I showed you before, that if there's a dot there, I'm starting to interpret that as drill in. It cannot be in the key of the, you know, just this thing. I had to fix that. Um, what I didn't put here, uh, by the way, it's, it's kind of all nice and working. You can filter by user, you can filter by date. Everything looks, looks very, very nice. If you try and click on one of those, you will get an error because there's no form to edit the special fields yet. Um, also, originally I, I had another field, which is the image field. And that, that was looking really nice until I actually put some image in there. And then the admin interface went like, woof. I, you know, I, I got like a massive amount of text 
which is the base64 encoded version of the image, and everything was compressed and left, decided that's kind of counterproductive and took off this, uh, this column. Okay? But if I go, I can, I can do delete, I can do like basic manipulations on those things. Very cool. Okay? Also, uh, load data and uh, dump data, right? <coughs> basic tools of Django works. Um, so, what's next? Um, you can go to the GitHub. Um, if you want to contribute, you know, I'll be happy to tell you what endless amount of things are still not working well and you're welcome to have a go at it. Or you can just fork. Uh, my wife saw the slide and asked me, what do you mean you're, you're telling people to go forking? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Oh, wow. That does sound strange. Go fork yourself. Go fork yourself. Uh, contact me. And uh, so uh, for those who are interested, I can talk about what does it mean to live with self. That's a big one, right? Because you just remember what we did. We, we took something that's very relational and went completely sideways. And worse than that, you can do that in the same app. You can have like two models that are normal relational, and one of them all of a sudden is Mongo, and Mongo doesn't care. There is no migration. You do whatever you want. You put more data, you put less data, no meaning. But I want, so I want South to disregard those models. So there's a, a little magic text that took me forever to put together that makes it all go away. So, um, you kind of add that to to the file, to the models file, and everything becomes okay. Interesting stuff. Uh, and uh, one more comment about unit testing. There's actually a lot more than than this one slide, but I thought that would be just uh, enough to discuss. So um, unit testing is super important. Um, when you run Unit testing in Django, it creates an addition, uh, kind of a, te a temporary data testing database where you don't mess up your data. And uh, if you do that with SQLite, it actually even moves to the memory. <coughs> All those are great things. Um, we were piggybacking on this, and uh, you actually get a test underscore collection name, same way, uh, where all your testing stuff will be done. So you're not touching your data. Um, and the framework senses that you're, you're actually in the mode of unit testing. That's not trivial. You need to look at what are the connections to the database, make some assumptions, make, understand the situation, act accordingly. Um, you define the Mongo connection in a very different way. Because you know uh, originally we, we kind of thought that we could fit that into the same database you know, settings piece. But if you do that, you know, uh, Django really doesn't like that. So we just bypass the whole thing. You can um, set up the name of the collection, you know, port, host, etc. And uh, that means that um, this is going to be the name of the <coughs> database that's created for the, your testing. Okay. Uh, I was uh, originally also planning to put like a slide or two about things that doesn't work, but that could be very boring and uh, there's a lot of them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> All sorts of things that doesn't work well, um, starting from trying to query across to databases and, yes? Uh, okay. Um, so, I'm curious if, to see if uh, we have more questions here. Uh, no, nothing new. I went to the aquarium on the weekend, and that was a fish. Yes. Uh, so, you, so you talked a lot about uh, the properties that. Uh, this has like in terms of like what you can do, but in terms of the actual plumbing of, of making it happen, 
uh, you know, for like just to take one thing is the uh, the underscore underscore exists, yeah. right? Yeah. So like, what did you actually have to do in the plumbing of mm. of your code to make that work? Um, okay, so yeah, I, um, it's it's an interesting question. I, I can't answer that in a single. It's not a single thing because there is there is this. Um, so if your manager, your your yeah. Operator. So we, you know, what 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 we did there is write a new manager, mm -hmm. and the manager have a very large amount of interfaces. They're not even very clean because it's not just the interface with its definition, but also the interface and its specific behavior mm -hmm. that we were unfortunately learning through experimenting, let's say, with the admin interface. The admin interface, all of a sudden, you see things that thought that are working that are no longer working because of this odd behavior or whatever. Um, I think the underscore underscore is done for you by Django. And the result of it is transferred to you, I think, but I'm not, I'm not sure. At some point, um, it's actually it's interesting because the code itself of the manager doesn't look very big. There's like two or three files that, that are the main kind of meat of it. And it's one of those things that, although there's not a lot of code, it took many, many, many you know, days and, and, and a lot of effort to get to that because there's, you know, there's all those there's a little change to see if it works, change again, change again. So you don't see it in the size of the code. So the code doesn't look very big. Um, within those two, three files, there is uh, at least one that's actually very close to PyMongo, meaning it takes the, the result and kind of composes this, this JSON query expression, ship it off. Um, there is the higher level manager that it does the interface, I think. I think the underscore underscore is actually done by Django, and you are getting the list of things that you need to go for. But um, the mechanics of it, obviously, is a Python mechanics where you it's basic introspection. When you're getting the set of parameters, you can get them as parameters, or you can get them as a list of, like, as a dictionary. And then when you get it as a dictionary, you can actually ask. You can actually take the name and break it apart by, let's say, underscore, underscore, and see what happens, right? So even if, if we had to do this plumbing, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure by now, uh, it's, not, it's not very complex right. plumbing. Yeah. yeah. OK? Yep. I'd love, <coughs> I'm going to keep my main database in Postgres, but I'd love for there to be a read-only replica of our data in Mongo, so that people who like to develop tools using Mongo can can do that. Can you imagine any way to achieve that with a, a tool like this, where you still want the you want to replicate from Mongo into Postgres? Other way around. Other way around. Yeah. Well, it depends how important, how deep and important is the is the relational aspect of it. Remember, as I as I said at the beginning, as you go, there's a, there's an assumption built into this, which is assume you had very little problem with space. How would you change your data? It leads you to replicate, to denormalize, replicate data and put it in multiple places. And then it leads you to change the code to actually do the accounting of all these different places where you put the data. Uh, and then you, you detach yourself from transactions and start working within, you know, so you, that's there's okay. a process. So let's assume in this process, you lose okay. something. Let's assume that the code that's going to be touching this Mongo is not Django. It's a new tool that's going to be written right. just to work with this stuff. Right. So it doesn't really matter that the that they're going to have to learn a new way of accessing the relation the relational aspects. Okay. Is, is it possible, do you think, to somehow set up the hooks so that each time you would write to Postgres, you also send a write to a Mongo re replica? Yeah. Yeah. It using, looks. It using looks. this code. Um, you can take uh, ideas from that code, but I think the code is um, it's not optimized to what you need, and maybe okay. you want to trim it down and just take what you need from it, right? Um, but again, if you have if you're relying heavily on relational information, it's going to be tough. Okay, although within Mongo you can actually express relations, there is a way to express a relation between objects. There's no notion of join, so if you need a heavy join to extract the data, it will yeah. never be efficient because you will implement it yourself and it's going to be a disaster. Thanks. Okay. Interesting. How do you want to do the books? Somebody fell asleep? No. Okay.